So with Jim Lee from WWF, we just heard you say this process is too important to fail. Tell us what you meant by that. Well, ultimately, if we're going to get to the level of urgent and ambitious action we need to have to meet the challenge of climate change, countries need to have confidence that everybody is acting together. So we need an ambitious but also binding legal agreement. And, so, and this is the process that can deliver that. So this is a process that must deliver. You talked about ambition earlier in the press conference as well. What's the problem with ambition that we're seeing here in this process? Well, you know, we have just uh, last month a report from the United Nations Environment Program that tells us if you take all the pledges that have been made, we're still between 6 and 11 billion tons of carbon dioxide short of what we need to be. See, So what we have is already a system which is not yielding action on the scale that's required to actually prevent uh, dangerous climate change. Was there more? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, so you, you talked about the, the lack of ambition. If, the, if there's a problem with ambition in this process, why do we keep moving forward with it? Well, this is a process that has to succeed. Uh, I think what we will see in Durban this week is some business that is important to get done. But what I hope we can also see is countries stepping back and recognizing that they have lost the plot, that they have to find a way to get onto a more ambitious track, set themselves a path for over the next two or three years, negotiating the kind of ambitious agreement that can meet the challenge. And we heard you talk about a lost decade. What did you mean by that? Well, we came into Durban having talked a lot about the importance of a post-2012 agreement. And now suddenly we see people talking about post-2020. The U.S. and others pushing for delaying the negotiation of an agreement or entry into force of an agreement till 2020. And that's a lost decade. I mean, that we simply cannot afford to wait to then to get to binding commitments for action. So what's your message to the United States delegation? My message to the United States delegation is we need you to step up. We need the United States as the second largest emitter in the world and the highest per one of the highest per capita emitters in the world to show the leadership we expect from them in other sectors and find a way to be part of mounting a global solution to climate change. And if they don't? If they don't, then I think the countries of the world need to say to the U.S. as they said in Bali, please lead or get out of the way. Who are the countries that are leading in this process? Well, I think South Africa is, is showing important leadership in its presidency of this process. I think you see um, China stepping up in an, in an interesting way over the last weekend. You see Europe ready to make a commitment to a second, uh, second commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol, and also taking, I think, real action to reduce its own emissions. You see leadership in, in many corners. You don't yet see it coming together around the level of action that's required. Do you have a message for China? I think it's crucially important that China does move on its uh, early indications that it's ready to be part of a comprehensive binding agreement and to build on the, the important things they're already doing at home, um, to show real leadership among the emerging economies in finding a path for low carbon growth. We've heard a lot of talk about a new comprehensive binding agreement. With all this talk about a new agreement, why are we still talking about Kyoto? Well, Kyoto has huge importance. For one thing, it's the only binding commitment we already have. And secondly, I think countries all over the world, especially developing countries, are looking to the developed countries to reaffirm that commitment, to show that they are, in fact, serious, and they will continue that while a broader agreement is negotiated. Where's all the money for this going to come from? You know that countries in uh, Copenhagen and then Cancun uh, pledged to put $100 billion a year on the table by 2020, and that needs to be a start of mobilizing the level of capital that is required to meet this challenge. It needs to be money that can leverage much larger sums from the private sector if we're going to actually make the transition that has to happen. Is that money all going to come from governments? No, the $100 billion um, needs to be public funds that can leverage those much larger amounts um, from the private sector. Have you seen any movement on the Green Climate Fund here? I think it's quite possible for the countries of, uh, to come together around important agreements on the Green Climate Fund, both to approve the mechanism moving forward and actually to move on the sources that would begin to put funds against that pledge. Importantly, from our perspective, the opportunity to levy a tax or charge on bunker fuels that could generate a reliable stream of funding that begins to get to the scale that we need to see. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you.